Well, uh, you know, today is, a, um, is another one of those special Shabbat uh, uh, days that leading up to uh, Pesach, leading up to uh, Passover. Remember, we had Shabbat Zachor a few weeks ago uh, that uh, reminded us of Amalek, right, and Haman and everything related to uh, Purim. Well, now Purim is... As I said at the very beginning of the service, Purim is in the rearview mirror, uh, and now uh, we're moving forward uh, to Passover and this rich season uh, of redemption. Uh, and so uh, next week it will be the beginning of Nisan, the beginning of uh, the month, the first month of the Jewish year, the month when Passover takes place, and the Shabbat just before Rosh Chodesh Nisan, or the head of the month, the beginning of the month of Nisan, is a, a very interesting uh, emphasis called Shabbat Para. Shabbat Para. So Shabbat Para uh, uh, is actually the Shabbat of the cow. <laughs> well, you know, the Shabbat of the cow. Is this about uh, drink more milk? Uh, you know, uh, and, and all of that, or is it a uh, Chick-fil-A advertisement going sideways or something? What, 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 what is it? Why are we talking about the Shabbat of the cow, right? Well, of course, it, uh, uh, it is the red cow, the uh, red heifer, right? Why do we talk about this obscure passage uh, in Numbers chapter 19? So uh, traditionally... Uh, after the regular Torah reading, uh, we would read uh, Numbers chapter 19 uh, uh, on, this, uh, on this day leading up to, to Passover. Uh, and what's also interesting is the Haftorah portion. Very interesting. And why that was chosen to put these two passages together. That is Ezekiel chapter 36, as we heard this morning. I, uh, you know, from uh, both a Grace and Abigail. Uh, why these passages together? And why do we read the story of the red cow? Uh, the reason is, is because in preparation for Passover, we want to think about being prepared, being prepared for Passover, uh, which means being uh, spiritually prepared, being cleansed. Uh, you know, do you remember the story in uh, Chronicles? when uh, Hezekiah becomes the king, right? Hezekiah decides uh, to, have, to have a conference. I remember 22 years ago, right, when uh, Beth Messiah hosted the UMJC conference. What a great moment that was, by the way, in our, in our communal history, right? And I remember, uh, you know, we put together a big team of people, uh, which we have a lovely framed photo of, by the way, here. Uh, and uh, Sherry Moore uh, uh, and others came from uh, out of town to sort of give us the directions and the marching order. This is what we need to do and everything. So I gave a, a little devotional at that meeting, and it was from the pa this passage in uh, Chronicles about when Hezekiah became the king, uh, that he decided that he was going to bring unity to the north and the south. You know, there was, he was the king of the southern kingdom of Judah. And there was the northern kingdom of Israel. And he decided, I'm going to bring unity uh, uh, to the north and the south, right? And so no better way than to throw a party, right? Uh, and so we'll celebrate Passover. Uh, we'll invite everyone for Passover. Uh, it's a great passage, uh, you, you know, that, that with a lot of meaning. But anyway, so what ends up happening is, is that so many people from the north wanted to come that there wasn't enough time even to cleanse everybody because everybody had to be ritually pure, ritually cleansed. So do you remember what Hezekiah does? We would say today, no way, Hezekiah, you can't do that, right? Uh, he sort of waves his hand over everybody, prays a prayer, you know, that they're, they're cleansed. And the text even comments, the writer of Chronicles, right, comments, this was not according to the, uh, you know, the traditional way of doing things, okay? But it, it evidently was okay, uh, and the people were cleansed, uh, and uh, they came together. Uh, and so at least uh, for uh, that period of time, 
there was a unity uh, in the north and the south, at least during that celebration of Passover. But the reason I mention it is because of this issue of cleansing, you know, of, of how there was a concern of people to be cleansed. Uh, we read even uh, in other places, like, for example, uh, in the 19th chapter of Exodus, when uh, the people were preparing to meet with God at Sinai, they had to be cleansed, they had to be purified, right? And so, therefore, Shabbat Parah is about cleansing, about being prepared for Passover. Now, it's very interesting, and I just want to spend, actually, a little time in uh, Numbers chapter 19. We actually want to look at three, three passages uh, and just gain some insight uh, about, uh, really, uh, what cleansing is uh, and how it relates to Passover and our own lives and our own community here at Beth Messiah. So in, in Numbers chapter 19, I, you have this uh, directive, this uh, law about the red heifer. Now, if you read uh, Jewish commentaries, uh, Jewish writers, I, there is, of course, all kinds of things we can get out of the, the issue of being cleansed. But the issue of the red cow itself, that spans you know, from A to Z of uh, speculation and, and understanding. But, you know, we weren't around 5,000 years ago, right? And there's just some things we don't know. I, uh, now, our, our good friend, our good Leviticus friend, Jacob Milgram, right, actually uh, knows things about other books of the Bible, <laughs> okay? So he wrote a, a classic commentary on Bamidbar, on, uh, on Numbers, I, and, and according to him, uh, first of all, the cow, because a cow is big, I, that was the, the reason what was because the cow is big. And this issue of purification was profound uh, and it would provide a lot of ashes to last for a long time. Right. The issue of it being red uh, had to do with blood, you know, a reminder uh, of blood. Uh, and they didn't use a bull. Uh, or a goat, because those were clearly associated with other kinds of offerings. So there, uh, you know, there you have it. But what is most interesting about this passage is why, uh, why they did this. And that's clearly in the text. It had to do with the issue of death, uh, death and touching a corpse. Right. So I'm just going to read um, a, a few verses here. Okay, uh, beginning, I, I guess, we'll uh, go down to verse 11, all right? Verse 11. Uh, we don't need to read the, the, the technicalities of how to do this offering for our purposes here today, but it's purpose, okay? So verse 11 in Numbers 19, uh, we read, um, actually, I guess in verse uh, 9, I'll start in verse 9. Now a man who is clean shall gather of the ashes of the heifer and deposit them outside the camp in a clean place. And the congregation of the sons of Israel uh, shall keep it as water to remove impurity. It is a purification from sin. Okay? Uh, and the one who gathers the ashes of the heifer shall wash his clothes and be unclean until evening. And it shall be a perpetual statue to the sons of Israel and to the alien who sojourns among them. The one who touches uh, the corpse of any person shall be unclean for seven days. That one shall purify himself with the uncleanness with the water on the third day of the seventh, uh, on, on the third day and on the seventh day, and then he shall be clean. But if he does not purify himself on the third day and on the seventh day, he shall not be clean. Anyone who touches a corpse, the body of a man who has died and does not purify himself, defiles the tabernacle of the Lord, and that person shall be cut off from Israel because, because the water for impurity was not sprinkled on him, and he shall be unclean, uh, and uh, the uncleanness is still on him. Okay, so in other words, the, this, the interesting thing about this animal is it wasn't so much they would, he, they would sprinkle the blood from his hand. But it wasn't so much about the blood, it was about the ashes 
of this, the, the remains of it. And they would mix it with water, right? And then they would use that uh, for this purpose of cleansing, all right? The, the important part, though, the important part for us is the fact that touching a corpse or coming into contact with death made a person impure, made a person impure. Uh, and if you remember uh, when we read the book of Haggai uh, a few weeks ago, consider your ways, remember that, right? Think about, you know, uh, think about your life and, and the trajectory of your life. Remember that uh, Haggai has this uh, sort of make-believe conversation uh, with a priest asking rhetorical questions. And one of those questions is, I, you know, if you come into contact with a dead body, does that make you impure? And the answer was yes. And the po- Haggai's point in, the, in that second temple period was that uh, a sin, a death, is identified with sin. Uh, and, and therefore, sin can be transmitted. You come into contact with it, it can make you impure. And certainly we know that's true. That's why we read verses uh, you know, that, that explain to us not to hang around with sinful people because, you know, uh, you, you can catch it, <laughs> right? Uh, although holiness, on the other hand, uh, comes from within. Just hanging around holy people doesn't make you holy. But hanging around impure people definitely can make you impure. Uh, and, uh, and, and so it, it's a very interesting issue, this issue of, uh, of defilement uh, and death. It, it seems that uh, when, uh, when you study these passages, uh, that um, anything related to death, which also included, actually, I believe in this week's Torah portion, the bodily fluids uh, uh, passages, Right, that when when a certain fluids from the body leave it, uh, a person becomes impure and is in need of ritual cleansing, uh, which includes coming into contact with a dead person, uh, as well as uh, other issues, and they all stem from this idea uh, of uh, impurity uh, and death. Right. Uh, and there was the understanding that as a whole person, as a, as a whole person, that, that death, uh, uh, death uh, the, the physicality of death, uh, pointed to an internal truth of, uh, of sin. And just as death hinders us, physical death hinders us, uh, from uh, following the commands of the Lord and living for the Lord, an internal, uh, the internal sinfulness of life is akin to physical death. And so, therefore, the understanding was is that when you come into contact with, with a corpse, it, it certainly reminds us or it creates a situation in where we become uh, impure. It, does, it doesn't mean we've done something horrible, Right? Uh, there's all kinds of impurities, but it meant that you couldn't go into the, you couldn't come near the tabernacle, or you had to stay outside the camp. There was a barrier, and just as sin is a barrier from uh, uh, you know um, intimacy with God, so uh, the physical death or impurities was a barrier to physically coming into contact with holy objects uh, and, and things. Uh, and, and so this issue of death was, um, was very important. In fact, I will tell you, in preparing for uh, you know, Ecclesiastes, Kohelet, death is, a, uh, is an overriding issue uh, in uh, Kohelet, in the book of Ecclesiastes. Why? Because, because we all die and it colors everything in, in life. Uh, and it hinders us from being able to, uh, you know, continue to, uh, you know, follow the commands of, of, the, of the Lord. And so there's this issue of overcoming death. That's really what this is about here in, uh, here in Numbers chapter 19. Uh, it's about overcoming, one might say, the stigma of death, right? Uh, of the sting, we might say, of, of death. 
Uh, and so in the Torah itself, there is a way of overcoming the impurity of debt. There is a way of overcoming it. Uh, and so here you have the story of, of the red cow. Now, the rabbis of the ancient world understood all this, of course, and that is why, and that is why it is so fascinating that Ezekiel 36 was chosen to be the passage that would be read on this particular Shabbat in conjunction with the red cow, right? Uh, because clearly, if we turn to Ezekiel 36, there uh, we see uh, a promise, basically a new covenant promise of the provision uh, of God to overcome profanity, to overcome Israel's sin of profaning God's name, of making God's name unholy. In other words, Israel had become ritually unclean, kind of like cleaning a corpse, kind of, kind of like touching a corpse, right? Uh, and so uh, we have in chapter 36, and then also 37, we have the answer to the problem. This is a great passage, and it really is amazing uh, that uh, our ancestors uh, put these two passages uh, together. And it has a great, of course, a great meaning for us uh, as well. You know, as we're approaching a Passover, we want to be ready for Passover, not just making sure we get our reservations in, right? And by the way, let me just say this about those reservations, right? If you call and you make a reservation, does not, does not mean we keep the reservation. I just want you to, all right? Okay. So that means, you know, you got to get that reservation in with, with the payment. All right. A little, little side note there. All right. Okay. Uh, and, uh, and not only that, but at home, like having a Seder, right? Uh, you got to, you know, you got to get the food this, and, and making the special recipes. Right, right Marcy? Right. It's a lot that goes in, right? Uh, in, into, uh, it, it's, a, it's a big mitzia, as we'll say, uh, uh, to, to, to make a Seder, right? You got to get the matzah, kosher for Passover. It's a lot of work, right? Uh, you, you know, not only is a lot of is it a lot of uh, uh, work in that regard. I don't know how many of you do this, but this uh, well, I grew up. Holy cow! I thought we were moving every year, right? Taking everything out of the kitchen, right? And and, and uh, other other pa kitchen paraphernalia uh, used. You know, it, it was more about being a slave in Egypt than than celebrating the freedom. I, I don't know but just a lot of work. But, you know, we can't let that get in the way of the important part, the important thing, right? A little bit of Mary and Martha here, right? Uh, the important thing of being cleansed, of being spiritually prepared. And now is the time for us to engage in that. So very well that we're talking about these things. So now in Ezekiel chapter uh, 36, I actually, uh, we can start... In uh, uh, verse 22, save a little time. We'll start in verse 22. It says, Therefore say to the house of Israel, thus says the Lord God, It is not for your sake, O house of Israel, that I'm about to act, but for my holy name, which you have profaned among the nations where you went. And I will vindicate the holiness of my great name, which has been profaned among the nations, which you have profaned in their midst. Okay? So to profane God's name means to demonstrate a lack of honor, reverence, care. I always like to use the illustration of, you know, if I buy a new pair of shoes, right, they're, they're kind of like holy. They're, they're separated from all the other shoes in the closet, right? But if I uh, walk uh, out on a rainy day and walk in a mud puddle, uh, you know, they're never going to be the same. No matter what I do, they're never going to be. So I'll say they're profane. Now they're just like the rest of the shoes in the closet. They're no longer holy. They're no longer separate. They're no longer different. They're no longer unique, right? Uh, and uh, and so uh, uh, consequently, this is what Israel had done. Done in that they had not They were not being a light to the nations. The light was dim, you know. Uh, and uh, and so here God says. This is what you've done, right? Even in, what, what's interesting about this is they went into captivity uh, because of profaning God's name. And even in the captivity, 
God's name is profane. But God, in His grace and in His mercy uh, and in His love and in His vision for His love for this world, He does not give up on the plan and He does not give up on the people, right? So that's why He says, I'm going ho- to vindicate the holiness of My name. I'm, gonna, I'm going to do a work in you so that you will fulfill your calling so that the nations will know who I am. Right? Okay. So, uh, so this is what he says. Then the nations will know that I am the Lord, declares the, de- declares the Lord God, when I prove myself holy among you in their sight. And now in verse 24, he says what he's going to do. He says, for I will take you from the nations gather you from all the lands and bring you into your own land. Okay? Then I will sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all your idols. Moreover, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you and I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. This is one of the rare passages, by the way, where flesh is like a good thing. <laughs> okay? All right, and I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you will be careful to observe my ordinances Uh, and you will live in the land that I gave to your forefathers. So you will be my people and I will be your God. He says, moreover, I will save you from you all your uncleanness and I will I will call for the grain and multiply it and I will not bring a famine on you. We can, we can stop there. So basically, what this says, among other things, that God would you know, restore the land, but then it says, I will sprinkle clean water uh, on you, uh, and you shall be clean. And I will give you a new heart, and I will place my spirit uh, within you. It sounds like it's coming right out of the Gospel of John, uh, it, it, doesn't it? This is the promise of the new covenant, articulated a little differently in Jeremiah chapter 31, where he says, I'll place my Torah in you. Here he says, I'll place my spirit uh, within you. And we read also in in the new covenant, not only that, but Yeshua comes to dwell in us. It's pretty crowded uh, in there. And it's all speaking about the presence of God, uh, you know, within us. But here we see that you'll be cleansed, right? And so uh, Ezekiel 36 kind of goes with Numbers chapter 19 uh, in that God indeed will cleanse us. This is a great promise that he's made. Even though we've blown it, even though we are unclean, right? And uncleanness certainly leads to, uh, to death, that I will purify you. I will, I will cleanse you. Uh, and I'm going to suggest, by the way, that this is what is in the mind of Yeshua in the third chapter of John when uh, Nicodemus comes to see him at night, right? So we read these words, uh, beginning in verse uh, 2 of John 3. Rabbi, we know that you've come from God as a teacher, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Yeshua answered and said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born from above, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he's old? He cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born, can he? Yeshua answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. I would suggest to us, or may I suggest, that... The water and the spirit here that Yeshua is referring to comes out of this passage in Ezekiel chapter 36. I will sprinkle clean water on you and I will place my spirit within you. Unless you have this experience, meaning you embrace the water and the spirit, you cannot see the kingdom of God. You cannot live. You cannot have eternal life. You cannot enter the Olam Haba. Right. Uh, And so uh, I here in Ezekiel 36, we see here is an antidote to the issue of uncleanness. Here is the antidote to impurity 
Here is the antidote, therefore, to overcoming death, to defeating death. Because when you go back to that red heifer, the goal was defeating death, right? Uh, Here in Ezekiel 36, you will be cleansed. You will be pure. You will, you know, I will be your God. You will be my people. You will reach the ultimate conclusion. Uh, In Jeremiah 31, uh, another way of saying this, I will forgive your sins. Your sins I will remember no more. I'll place my Torah within you and your sins I will remember no more, right? Uh, and this is all about the new covenant, all about, indeed, what, uh, what Yeshua did uh, to give us uh, a cleansing uh, and uh, overcoming, uh, overcoming uh, a death, right? Now, in the Brit uh, Harasha, in the new covenant, in uh, the book of Hebrews, right, in the uh, ninth chapter, right, in Hebrews chapter 9, uh, in verse uh, 13, it says, For if the blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer, sprinkling those who have been defiled, sanctify for the cleansing of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Messiah, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without blemish to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works uh, to serve the living God? In other words, uh, he's saying that the, uh, the finished work of Yeshua, the Messiah, uh, is, does the work, and more so eternally, of what the bulls and the goats and the ashes of the red heifer were supposed to do. The blood of Messiah overcomes, uh, overcomes death. The blood of a Messiah, therefore, uh, gives us life. It takes away, what do we call it? It takes away the sting of death, this issue of overcoming death. And isn't it interesting that uh, we're going uh, back and forth here. If you go to the book of Isaiah for just a second, or you can just listen, it's okay. Uh, in chapter 25, we have this great statement about the Messianic days. It's a great statement about the Messianic. We read, and the Lord uh, of hosts will prepare a lavish banquet for all peoples on this mountain, a banquet of aged wine, choice pieces with marrow and refined aged wine. And on this mountain, he will swallow up the covering which is over all people, even the veil which is stretched over all nations. He will swallow up death for all time. And the Lord God will wipe tears away from all faces and he will remove the reproach of his people from all the earth for the Lord has spoken. The point here is you see this emphasis whether we're talking in the Torah about the red heifer overcoming the impurity of, of death or uh, you know we're, we're talking um, about a spiritual uh, a barrier between ourselves and God, like a spiritual death, which is how, which is how our ancestors understood this. That is that is an amazing thing. Our ans- our Jewish ancestors, our rabbinic teachers of millennia past, understood the impurity of the of coming into contact into contact with a corpse as a barrier to living for God. And it pointed to them, to a spiritual, internal barrier that has to be taken away. That's how they understood it. And that is why Ezekiel 36 goes with this passage of of God taking away the spiritual uh, impurity. And that is why the writer of Hebrews recognizes that in Messiah Yeshua, that is uh, what happens. And that is why Yeshua was explaining to Nicodemus, I am the one who's going to bring to pass what is promised in Ezekiel 36 about being, about being, uh, about being cleansed, right? Uh, and, and so isn't it interesting that in the Brit Hadasha, in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, what do we read at the end of the chapter? We read this about the perishable overtaking, or the imperishable overtaking the perishable. Okay? 
Perishable means death. Imperishable means life forever, right? And so here, what Paul is explaining is that in the finished work of the Messiah, the death and resurrection of the Messiah, we have the, the, the ultimate, final defeat of the impurity of the death. He says in verse 53, For this perishable must put on the imperishable, and this mortal must put on immortality. But when this perishable will have put on the imperishable, and this mortal will have put on, the, put on immortality, then will come about the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin. You see the relationship there that, that he makes? I, I, the, the rabbis <laughs> would agree with that, right? Okay? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is, uh, the, is we'll say, not the Torah, but a, but a legalism. Uh, you know, uh, that's what he's speaking of there. But thanks be to God who gives us victory through our Lord Messiah Yeshua. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast and movable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your toil is not in vain in the Lord. Okay, in other words, because death, the, the impurity of death is defeated when we embrace the Messiah, our toil is not in vain. Oh, all I can say is Ecclesiastes. Oh, anyway, all right. I, I, and, and that therefore, I, I, in Yeshua, in Yeshua, we have not just, you know, uh, I'm, I'm saved. Uh, I'm going to heaven when I die. But now what he means here is this death is defeated. Uh, and now, now that relates, of course, how does that relate? Well, how does all this relate to, to Passover? Well, it relates to Passover because of the cleansing, because we want to remember. We, we want to remember uh, uh, to be cleansed. In a traditional understanding, we want to remember the need to be cleansed. I would say as a, as a Messianic community, we want to remember the cleansing that we have in Messiah Yeshua and the need at the very same time to confess our sins and to be spiritually prepared uh, uh, to celebrate uh, to celebrate Passover, but there's one one other uh, little thing here, and that is in uh, also in First Corinthians, in First Corinthians chapter five and verses seven and eight, and this really becomes the uh, the application of the whole thing of this issue of remembering. Uh, how in Messiah Yeshua, the contamination of death is defeated and we have life forever uh, in Messiah. And so in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, you're probably familiar with it, most of us. Paul is writing to this congregation and remember, he calls them holy ones. He calls them holy ones. But man, uh, their practice was anything but in a certain respect. They were allowing... Uh, we'll just call it, they were allowing sexual immorality of a certain kind to run rampant in the congregation and not to do anything about it uh, because they really thought they were, they were really something. You know, they, they were really something. They were God's gift. Uh, they, they, were, uh, they were a spiritual bunch, uh, but they turned a, bl a blind eye to sin. So Paul, uh, you know, calls them on the carpet, uh, calls them on the carpet, right? And he says this in verse 6. Your boasting is not good. That's an understatement, right? Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump of dough? Much like the issue of coming into contact with a dead body brings impurity, all right? Uh, and so he's saying a little sin is going to contaminate the whole. And so you become impure. You become unclean. You become useless in the sense of being able to be used of God. You may be going through the religious motions and singing songs or dancing or rejoicing, praising God, but if sin is running rampant in the, in the community, you are contaminated. You are contaminated. Okay? So what does he say? He says, clean out the old leaven that you may be a new lump. When he says, clean out the old leaven, that is, of course, talking about Passover. Talking about Passover. 
clean out the old leaven. Isn't that what we do? We clean out the leaven, right? No leaven to be, no bagels at Passover, no rye bread, right? None of that good stuff, right? Uh, we have the bread of affliction, also called the bread of life. Oh, but that's another story. I, I, we eat, you know, we eat, we eat matzo. We, we eat unleavened bread. Clean out the old leaven. So he uses it. He uses the cleaning out of the leaven at Passover as a metaphor for cleaning out the sin in our community. Do you know that? Do you know that the context of this is not about my life or your life. It's about our lives together. But it's the, we're the sum of the parts, right? So it certainly applies indeed to uh, all of us, right? If we, are, if we are secretly engaged in sinful activity that we know is like an ongoing thing, don't think it's just about you. How convicting is that, right? As I look in the mirror, right? Clean out the old leaven that you may be a new lump. But then look what he says. Not only that you may be a new lump, the promise of, yes, new life and restoration and, and so on. But then he says, just as you are unleavened, what he's saying is, well, then he said, for Messiah is our Passover, for Messiah our Passover also has been sung. He's saying, in Messiah, you are cleansed. In Messiah, you are, quote unquote, unleavened, right? But you're acting in a way that, you, that it doesn't really reflect who you are. Clean out the old leaven, clean out the sinfulness so that you can reflect who you are really are, right? Uh, you're living as if you are contaminated. You are living like a dead corpse. But, you know, by the blood of Messiah, He is our Passover because He died for our sins, like the, the Lamb, the exchange of life. The Lamb died, the firstborn could live, right? Because of, of that in Messiah Yeshua, we are able to live and uh, we become, quote-unquote, purified. Uh, uh, death no longer has sway over us. That means we can live our lives serving God and recognizing that our, as Paul says at the end of chapter 15 there of 1 Corinthians, that our work before God is not in vain. It has eternal consequences because, because death doesn't hold us back any. Uh, and so then he says here, let us therefore celebrate the feast, not with the old leaven, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity uh, and of truth. Uh, you know, uh, let us celebrate it as Messiah followers who truly reflect the life of Messiah. Uh, no malice, no wickedness, nothing that gets in the way. That, that is a barrier because the barrier contaminates. And so let us live that way. And so when we think about the ashes of the red heifer, and then we think about, uh, you know, the promise of God in uh, Ezekiel 36, and then we think about the, what Messiah has done for us. He cleanses our conscience. He frees us. That's, that is the writer of Hebrews way of saying he frees us. Uh, from the bondage of guilt and shame. He frees us from the bondage of serving guilt and shame in an Egypt uh, for our whole lives where many of us say, yeah, I know I'm a believer, but my life is so messed up. You know, uh, it's just that uh, I'm like crawling my way to the end. It, you, you know, it does not have to be that way because in Messiah Yeshua, let us be who we really are. We are cleansed from the bondage of death and how it <laughs> overlays our lives. And, you know, there's a lot of things that we could call death in our lives. Sinful uh, temptations, addictions, uh, other things that hold us back in, in life that in Messiah Yeshua, he can do, uh, do a work uh, in that. And just, you know, in closing, that it's, you know, the, the good news of Passover, the good news of Messiah, our Passover, is not only the death of the Messiah, right? Because we saw the resurrection. In the resurrection, death is conquered, right? 
Well, do you know that in a message in a few weeks, we're going to look at Passover and we're going to notice uh, that over and over and over again eh, throughout the, the scriptures, we're called not only to remember Egypt, remember what happened, to re but remember what God did with his outstretched arm, right? The power of God. And when you read those passages and like the verses before it and after it in those contexts, it's almost always talking about parting the waters of the Red Sea. And so the Israelites walk out into the wilderness on dry ground and then the waters close up and drown the Egyptians. That's <laughs> that is, uh, you know, that is when we talk about the power of God, Israel, you know, that if they had gone to the border of the Red Sea, they would have been. It would have been useless. It would have been meaningless. The whole Passover experience in that initial Egyptian Passover would have been meaningless if the waters of the Red Sea didn't part. The people would have, would have just been nothing. It would have been gone. It would have been not useless. Right? And so, without the resurrection of the Messiah, the, the death of Yeshua, as Paul says in, in chapter 15, you know, would have been useless. And we would be the most people to be pitied. Right? without the resurrection. And, and so, therefore, by the death and resurrection of Messiah Yeshua, we indeed find our, our cleansing when we receive Messiah. But the good news also is here in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. He, remember, he calls them holy ones, even though they've totally blown it, right? So maybe we've blown it. We're coming to Passover broken. We're coming with all kinds of tsuris, uh issues, problems, uh, internal internal and and uh, you know and other things going on in our lives but may we remember uh, let us go about the task over the next few weeks of cleansing cleaning out the old way you know uh, wh whether that means physically getting rid of things <laughs> that uh, get in the way of uh, our uh, walk with the Lord or you know uh, confessing sins, or maybe, uh, you know, uh, sharing with a, a trusted spiritual friend, you know, uh, praying together over, over issues in our lives. But let us clean out that. Let us take the initiative, clean out the old leaven, be a new lamb, be who we really are, and indeed celebrate Passover uh, uh, in the way God would have us to do so. Yes, remembering the outgoing from Egypt, remembering the death and resurrection of the Messiah, but also in the present, in the present, experiencing that intimacy of uh, where God says, I am your God and you are in Let us be that as we prepare us. Lord, uh, uh, God, I, we pray uh, this morning, God, for ourselves, that we as a Beth Messiah, as a congregation, I, that we might confess our sins, uh, Lord, uh, and that we might be a new lump, that we might come to Passover with a, uh, a refreshment of a, a celebration, Lord, of remembering the great work that you did in the past uh, in Egypt, that the, the great work you did in Yeshua, the great work you're going to do in the future, and the one you're doing now, Lord God. Uh, and may we not only find refreshment, but may we find breakthrough as we move perhaps in some ways from impurity to purity, as we move from profaning your name to making your name holy in all the things we do. And Lord, may as a result of that, may we find empowerment and refreshment and newness, uh, God. And we thank you, God, uh, that we know that in Messiah Yeshua, we find cleansing, we find forgiveness. When we confess our sins, you are faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all of our sins. Thank you for the praise.